I came to music through classical music. I mean, I, I came up as a classical flutist, um, um, thinking I was going to be on the orchestral trajectory and uh, was doing quite well at that until I was 19 when I discovered what orchestral life would be like at the highest level um, at, at Tanglewood and realized it, it just wasn't for me. Um, so I turned left and uh, went out into the wilderness and just discovered, I, like so many of us, that what I'm really here for was to make my own path. And How did you pick the flute? I picked the flute because I heard it on the radio when I was a little kid. Uh, it was actually uh, a piccolo and it was in uh, Rockin' Robin <laughs> on the radio. Uh, the original Bobby V version, not the Michael Jackson remake. As um, I began to think about the flute in a wider way than the classical tradition. Um, you know, I was kind of comparing my sonic world with the sonic worlds I was hearing all around me. And, um, you know, in the late 60s, you couldn't help but notice what was happening in the world of the electric guitar, for example. And um, the two leading flute lights of the day were uh, the French I mean, Jean-Pierre Rampal and the American Julius Baker. And the difference between Rampal and Baker in the classical frame of reference was pretty big, but compared to the difference between George Harrison and Jimi Hendrix, it was very small. And, you know, I thought, well, why couldn't the flute have this incredibly wide ranging sonic territory? Now, as an acoustic musician, I didn't really understand how much of that they did with um, electronics. I just heard what they were doing and went for it. <laughs> and um, in many ways, my music has been profoundly influenced by electric instruments and also electronic music. Um, I was perhaps one of the very last to study electronic music just before the synthesizer and it was actually a very good thing to do the way you had to think about sound you know in the rawest of components i mean you really built it from scratch uh, it changed the way i heard all instruments and especially the flute you know forever um, and i'm really really glad for that um, so another very formative experience i had quite young um, my mother was a piano teacher and I heard her start innumerable students and they started with one note at a time and then they had two notes and then there was harmonies and melodies, things like that. Uh, my older brother played the cello and I heard him begin with one note and after a little while I started to hear chords. I thought all the instruments were like that. So, you know, every week at the flute lesson, um, you know, you learned a couple of new notes higher and higher and um, Eventually, one week, we reached the new note moment in the lesson, and my teacher just went right on, and I said, well, don't we have a new note? And he said, no, you know all the notes. Well, you know, we knew all the notes he knew. Um, and, I, and then I said, well, don't we do two notes now? And he said, no, the flute only plays one note at a time. I was so pissed. Really, I, 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 I'm sure I was the most upset nine-year-old in New York City on that day. I mean, there was just smoke curling out of my ears. What a rip-off. You know, everybody else gets to do all these things one note at a time. And I remember thinking in that kind of nine-year-old way, like, that's going to change. You know, without having a clue as to how or whatever. And, um, yeah, I mean... That, that vision was something that kind of went underground for a while as, you know, I was becoming a better and better player, but it really did resurface um, in the period where I, I started to find myself as a musician. And um, one of the things I did um, was that as a senior in college, I started on this project to write a book which involved 
exploring all the possible sounds the flute could make, uh, excluding only things that would be damaging to the player or damaging to the instrument. Um, and so I worked on that and as a senior project and then I went to um, music school as a composition student, not as a flute student, because I had actually done most of the things the flute students were doing, and, and I didn't want to play in orchestras anymore at that point. Um, so I finished it uh, in the first year in graduate school, and it's called The Other Flute, a performance manual of contemporary techniques, and it got published by Oxford University Press. Um, and since uh, then, um, I also self-publish all my stuff, and I recovered the copyright and made a new edition and continue to sell it um, to this day. It's, and it is the book that composers use everywhere that, you know, uh, if you want to find out what intervals are possible or what alternate fingerings are for a note, and things like that. I mean, of course, in the end, no book can get it all because the better you play, the more you can reach things you couldn't reach before. And like all forms of art, which is life, uh, it's, it's endless. I wasn't that interested in breaking the rules as, as more in just like disregarding them. <laughs> I mean, what for? <laughs> I mean, what rule has ever made me a million dollars? You know, <laughs> I mean, what have rules done for me? You know, <laughs> so, um, and and um, and most people who are busy following the rules, honestly, um, you kind of sometimes have to scratch your head and wonder. So, um, I do find now, as years later, that um, I've had so many wonderful students who have come because they want to learn the kind of things that I've done, and they want to make their own music. So, um, you know, even inside, under the umbrella of um, our classical department here, which is where I teach uh, my flute students, um, they are evolving beautifully. I mean, uh, several of them have are writing their own music and and so you know it's not like we're forgetting about the past because um, we're not um, it is true the little koan that the height of your flight is directly proportional to the depth of your roots um, the um, and and we do classical repertoire as well um, I don't actually perform it that much anymore because uh, of simply lack of opportunity. It's, it's, it's again, it's one of those weird things about the business of music. Uh, if you've managed to somehow create an identity, which is hard enough, uh, well, then you've got it, and um, which is good. But it also means that people are not that likely to think of you for your other dimensions as well. And I'm sure that's as true, you know, as it is for me as for many, many other people. I mean, you know, I, I mean, creativity is rarely just one-dimensional, and and people have, you know, their their backgrounds and their interests. And I think the more creative you are, the wider your interests are. And and um, and and so lots of people can do many, many things that they're not asked to do because no one just thinks, hmm, what would Robert Dick sound like playing the Ebert Concerto, you know? <laughs> Instead, they're more likely to go, well, we know that James Galway is going to pack the house playing the Ebert Concerto, and James Galway is going to play the bejesus out of it, too. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. So they'll think in those terms, and that's kind of human nature. <laughs>